As chair of the board of the University of Washington Health Sciences deans, let me welcome you to the 17th John R. Hognes Symposium. Uh, this symposium was established in 1979 by the Board of Regents to honor Dr. Hognes. Dr. Hognes has had a distinguished career as a physician, teacher, researcher, and university administrator. He served as the 26th president of the university from 1974 to 1979 was the first president of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, and was president of the Association of Academic Health Centers and vice president of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is a former dean of the University of Washington School of Medicine and medical director of the University of Washington Medical Center. Unfortunately, Dr. Hognes is unable to join us this year, and he sends you all his greetings and is sorry he could not be here. The symposium obje objectives are first to inform and illuminate issues of healthcare policy on a national level. Second, to involve health sciences students. Third, to be action oriented. That is, it should be inspire those present to become involved with the subject. This year, that subject is poverty, and anyone who has struggled with poverty knows how expensive and costly it is. The six health sciences schools, School of Dentistry, School of Medicine, School of Nursing, School of Pharmacy, School of Public Health and Community Medicine, and School of Social Work participate in planning this important event. I'd like to thank the members of the committee for their diligence and hard work in putting this outstanding program together. And it's going to be a very stimulating afternoon, I can guarantee that. Let me introduce Dr. Bobby Berkowitz, Chair of the 2005 John R. Hognes Symposium Planning Committee and Alumni Endowed Professor of Nursing at the University of Washington. She will introduce our speaker, Dr. Harold Freeman, who walks the talk. Welcome, everyone. What a pleasure to see you all. I think our terrific turnout confirms what the planning committee actually already knew, and that is that our topic of social justice and health disparities and our speaker, Dr. Harold Freeman, uh, was definitely the right choice. So uh, welcome. Uh, as you know, the University of Washington uh, Health Sciences schools, all of us, have been active participants in teaching and community service and research around the topic of health disparities. In fact, uh, our health sciences schools have several centers funded by the National Institutes of Health on health disparities uh, research. Uh, and this is why it is such a great honor uh, to welcome Dr. Harold Freeman, um, who is one of our nation's uh, distinguished and honored and experts in the field of interrelationships among poverty, culture, social injustice and cancer, and on cancer disparities. So let me just tell you a, a little bit about him. Dr. Freeman is the founder and medical director of the Ralph Lauren Center for Cancer Care and Prevention in Harlem, New York. He is currently a senior advisor to the director of the National Cancer Institute and is a professor of clinical surgery at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. For the past five years, Dr. Freeman was an associate director of the National Cancer Institute and founding director of the National Cancer Institute Center to Reduce Cancer Health Disparities. He served as the national president of the American Cancer Society from 1988 to 1989 and was the chief architect of the American Cancer Society's initiative on cancer in the poor. In 1990, the American Cancer Society established the Harold Freeman Award, which is given to individuals who have made outstanding contributions in the fight against cancer in the poor. Up until the year 2000, Dr. Freeman served as the chairman of the United States President's Cancer Panel during both the first President Bush's and uh, President Clinton's administrations. Uh, he was elected to the Institute of Medicine in 1997. And those are only a few uh, of the many achievements on his bio. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Harold Freeman.
it's a it's a really a great privilege for me to be here. Uh, I've had a very stimulating day so far. I particularly like to talk to to young people. And and I like to the reason I like to talk to young people is that I never know when there might be somebody in the audience that I could touch to move them in a certain direction. So I, I spent a lot of time talking to young people because young people are really our future. I, I want to start in a very, very big way. And I'm going to talk about universal things. And I'm talking about specific things, such as my experience in Harlem. And I'm going to talk particularly about poverty and, and culture and social injustice, which is the title of my talk. But I really would like to think that I will challenge your thinking about these issues. One thing that will come out in my talk is that the way that I'm looking at these issues uh, goes across disciplines. Uh, I, I want to make that point because we're all educated in specific areas. If you go to college, you'll take history, literature, mathematics, and if you're taught the course, that's all you'll hear from that particular professor. Uh, when you graduate from college, it's up to you to put it all together. So we teach in specific disciplines life operates across disciplines. And so that our understanding has to take that into account, as well as our remedies. So let me start very, very, very big. And I'll start with something that I learned from Carl Sagan, uh, who was an extraordinary person, professor at Cornell, who said in one of his public television broadcasts back 20 years ago, that the universe is 15 billion years old, the universe. And he said that if you put the 15 billion years onto a 12-month calendar, then you would have what he called a cosmic calendar. That would mean that every month is approximately one point, one and a quarter billion years per month. By the cosmic calendar, the Earth and the Sun came into existence, he said, in September. And by the cosmic calendar, man has only been on this planet within the universe for a few minutes before midnight. And civilization is 20 seconds old. Let's put it into perspective. With respect to the species that we belong to, man, modern, modern man. We're told that modern man began perhaps 100,000 years ago in a certain part of Africa and later migrated to the rest of the world to become the people that we are in our various places and cultures. But that means something very important to me. That really means that there's only one race, and that is the human race. And so we're going to talk about race today, but I, the, the underlying principle is that there's one race. And even to carry it a little further, perhaps one way to talk about this is we all came out of Africa, so perhaps in America, all of us are African Americans. Can you accept that? Think, think about it. So, <clears throat> Gunnar Myrdal, the, the great Swedish sociologist, came to this country in the early 1940s. He wrote a book that you all should read. The book is called The American Dilemma. He came to this country and he saw a country that had a certain history. We're going to go a little bit into that history. And he wrote a book that was called The American Dilemma. The dilemma being that the country was founded on certain principles that had to do with freedom and equality, the Declaration of Independence. 
But the country he saw, going from north to south, from east to west, was a country that was divided, and that there was a segment of the popula population who were black Americans at the time, now called African Americans, who were not being treated as equals. Gunamir Dow said, this is a dilemma, and it will have to come to a head because the majority of people were going through their day-to-day -day activities as though everything was all right. Well, it did come to a head with the Civil Rights Movement in the mid-60s, led by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and after some changes, the laws of America are fair. But now we're dealing with the hearts and minds of American people. So with that, with that background, <clears throat> looking at the larger picture, we're in a universe together. We have a certain common origin, uh, followed by migration. Uh, and we have a country that has a history in and of itself. And that history is interesting in that it's a history that seemed to have begun, at least according to the record, in 1492, although I believe the country was here before that date. Uh, when Columbus uh, discovered America. Well, I have some questions about that because I find it difficult to believe that you can discover a country with people already in it uh, who are now called the Native Americans. So we got off on perhaps the wrong foot. And, and so we're going to talk about issues related to universality, related to specific experiences, related to race, related to poverty, and related to behavior uh, in the form of culture. Another universal point, survival is a fundamental instinct seen in all biological forms, and man is no exception. But people are born into certain social, political, economic circumstances that influence whether or not they will survive at all, and also the quality of such survival. In 1989, I was president of the American Cancer Society. We visited China. It was immediately after the Tiananmen Square episode, so we were the first Americans in after that, and we were a little bit frightened, but it worked out fine. On that trip, I learned this, that in the Chinese language, the same word that means opportunity um, means risk or crisis. So for the Chinese people, according to that, a crisis is also an opportunity. Um, the history of my own experience proves that to be true. So it means that when you face a crisis, you have to look for an opportunity. And, and uh, we've had a number of crises. We've had a crisis recently in New Orleans where a storm hit. And that could be a signal for opportunity. We'll see how it works out. But in the Chinese language, a crisis is an opportunity. When I started my career in Harlem that I chose specifically uh, as, a, as a place to go to after training, um, I faced a population of people that were presenting with very, very late cancer. I'd been well trained as a surgeon at Memorial Sloan Kettering and Idealist, idealistically, I chose Harlem to go to because that is where I thought I should go to help people who were poor and black. But I soon became frustrated because the skills that I had, being a technically well-trained surgeon, were too often not the answer for the people that I had to treat. Because the women, in particular with breast cancer, were coming in too late. I often saw women coming in with no breast that was visible, only cancer, ulcerated mass. And so that drove a young surgeon, myself, 
to look beyond the discipline that I had been trained in. And, and I want the young people here to think about that because that, that was a turning point for me. Trained one way, facing a crisis, which then became an opportunity for me to seek an understanding of why people could in America, the most advanced country in the history of the world, could come in presenting with ulcerated cancers. And that was an epiphany for me. It made me turn to the community and it drove my career. So the first question was for me, since these people were black and they were also poor, I'm working at a city hospital, people are black and poor. I'm beginning to raise the question then, as early as 1970, what is driving this? These people, does, does being black cause you to die from cancer? A question. What, what is the effect of poverty? What is the effect of race and poverty? And, and can you disentangle those effects? And if you could, do they still interrelate in some manner? Those were the questions that as a young surgeon, I began to, to ask. What is the meaning of race? Fundamental question. Who is black? What does it mean to be black? What does it mean to be white? What is the meaning of poverty? There was a writer who, who, who asked the question to, was asked the question of what does it mean to be black? And his name was James Baldwin, the novelist. And in an interview on television, which I saw, uh, he was asked um, questions about race. And he gave an interesting answer to the interviewer who was a white male. And his, his, his answer was this, as long as you believe that you are white, I will have to say that I am black putting the burden of definition on the other side. And I thought that was an interesting answer by James Baldwin. We're going to go deeper into that. How do we disentangle the causes of disparity, particularly race and poverty, and the interrelationships between the two conditions? Well, let's shift now to some statistics. I'm not going to burden you, you with many statistics. I think you know these statistics, but here's a, an important slide because it shows uh, the life expectancy from the time of birth of females, males, blacks, and whites. Fundamentally, it shows that the top line at the top of the chart represents white females who live to be approximately 80 years old in America. The bottom blue line is black males who live to be approximately 68 years old. And the two lines in between represent black females and white males who live the same length of time, about 75. <clears throat> so what is the meaning of this? Difference in male and female, that would require some study. And difference in black and white, so th these are fundamental uh, statistics that need to drive our thought. Looking at cancer incidents, we find that the black male, the second set of bars, has the highest overall incidence by far than any other group, and the white female has a slightly higher incidence than in any other female group, overall cancer. Other groups, Asian, Native American, Hispanic, somewhat lower. Who dies? And I was asked earlier today, what do I believe is the most, the best definition of disparities? And I, my answer is this. In my opinion, the most robust and accurate definition of disparities is who dies too soon? Who dies too soon? There are many other things to look at. Incidents, uh, different diseases, hepatoma, all kinds of ways to look at the problem. It looks to me like the fundamental question 
defining disparities is if you have populations of people who die sooner than others. And by this measure, it would be the African-American male first and the African-American female in this country. Shifting to another paradigm, since the war against cancer was declared in 1971 by President Richard Nixon, um, we've shifted a lot more money to, to research, which is very important. But there's a dilemma here, too, because it appears to me that our delivery system is dis disconnected from our discovery system. And that if, in fact, we applied all that we know to all people, irrespective of who they were, whether they could pay for services or whatever, that we would go a long ways in correcting disparities. But we haven't, we haven't done that. So one of the paradigms that I'd like to present to you is that the discovery delivery disconnect to a large extent the, uh, drives disparities. In other words, what we know is not necessarily related to what we do. Very important issue. There are many landmark reports uh, about disparities that are pictured here. Uh, we will not have time to go into these major reports. Uh, but starting back as early as uh, uh, early 70s, reports been, began to come out that uh, talked about racial disparities. Later on, poverty became an issue, not right away. Uh, I was involved in some of these studies. For example, in 1986, uh, I, was, I was involved as chairman of a committee of the ACS that looked at race and poverty. The question was, looking at black and white races, we didn't have enough information on other races. Um, we knew that there were disparities by that time between blacks and white and cancer outcome. We also knew that poverty was somehow mixed in to the, the, the causes. This committee studied for two years this issue and concluded that the black and white differences in cancer outcomes are primarily a function of economic status. A very major finding um, because if there are remedies to fix something, you need to aim your guns correctly. And if poverty is the overwhelming force that is driving black and white disparities, then it, 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 it suggests a different set of remedies than it would be if being black in and of itself was driving the disparity. It's certainly a complex set of issues because the history that we've lived through in this country um, is a history of social injustice uh, that we can go through the various, uh, we're going to have a slide to show you quickly uh, the picture of 500 years of this country's history. But the current status of black Americans with respect to economic status is to some extent a product of that history. And so social injustice may operate today to a certain extent, but it appears to me that the principal effect of social injustice with respect to black and white differences is the historical effect. And, and we need to, to acknowledge that. It, it doesn't mean that there's no injustice now. In fact, there is. Report to the Nation of the American Cancer Society issued in 1989, three years later. Uh, I led that effort. We went to seven American cities in the spring of 1989 to hear the testimony of poor people of all races who had experienced cancer. They were white. They were black, they were Native American, they were Asian, they were Hispanic. And there were some things that were universally true among all of the people who testified. And we've listed the main findings here. The people who were poor and had cancer said, in every case, that they met barriers when they attempted 
to get through the healthcare system. That they made sacrifices in trying to get care. A gentleman testified in New Jersey, for example, he was a white middle-aged man who had been treated for cancer. <clears throat> he said, Dr. Freeman, I lost my house, I lost my job, I lost my car, and now I lost my dignity. And perhaps the loss of dignity is worse of all. There was a woman who testified in Atlanta, Georgia, a black woman with incurable cer cervical cancer. And she said in her testimony, I know that I am poor, but they, referring to her doctors, make me feel like I'm poor. A person who was poor, actually. But worse for her was the people who were treating her, she said, make, makes her feel like she's poor. Not acceptable. We had a, a young man who was a very robust farmer. He was in his 30s, testified in California. And he said, my wife, Emma, and I have considered getting a divorce, although we love each other. Why? Because then the young daughter, Emma, uh, could get a transplant for her, her leukemia. Because a single mother would have justified the payment. It cost $200,000. He didn't. She didn't get treated in time. She died. A very moving story. We had a, an Asian woman testify also in California <clears throat> she said, they look into my eyes, speaking of her doctors and her nurses, but they do not, and they do not see the pain that I have, but the pain is there. Depicting perhaps a culture of people who don't express pain in a way that is well understood, but the pain is there. These are examples of those hearings, uh, the testimony. So poor people experience more pain and suffering. Uh, poor people often testify that the educational material we were presenting to them from the American Cancer Society and the government was insensitive and irrelevant to them. And poor people often became fatalistic, giving up hope. So th these were the findings in 1989, the hearings on cancer and the poor. Shifting to another aspect about race. An Institute of Medicine report just about two years ago showed that there's a difference in how people are treated for cancer and other diseases according to race. Uh, for example, people who have renal failure, how many get referred for renal transplant? Um, Race matters. Studies show race matters, even at the same economic status insurance. In one study by Peter Bach uh, on early lung cancer, there's a 12% difference between white and black patients with early lung cancer with respect to who got the curative treatment, which is certainly blacks being on the lower side. There are studies from California and Atlanta in emergency rooms that show differences in who gets treated for pain with long bone fractures, Hispanic and black, two different cities. And it made a difference, a big difference, about who got treated for pain with morphine-like drugs. In New York City, the, one of the major hospitals began to notice that the patients were coming back to them who had been prescribed morphine-like drugs for chronic debilitating conditions, saying that my pharmacy won't fill the prescription. And so they, they collected data on this, going to all the pharmacies and survey paper in the New England Journal of Medicine just a few years ago called We Don't Carry That. The pharmacies in the black and Hispanic communities didn't even carry the, the drugs like morphine 
uh, in 75% of the cases. And so, um, what, what drives this? What is race? How does it influence us, our decisions? The Institute of Medicine concluded that race matters as a determinant of how people get treated, even at the same economic status, same education, same insurance. It raises questions. What could drive it? <clears throat> and there's some answers to that. One answer might be that there's bias on the part of caregivers. Recent reports, too, have added other factors, like uh, uh, the census study was national, combining SEER data with Medicare data. Um, it didn't sort out the point that there's some geographic areas of America where people are treated differently. They, they, they're captured into an area that simply doesn't provide good health care. And black Americans were disproportionately represented in that group. So it's a complex issue. <clears throat> It's also an issue of how people see the medical care system, uh, belief systems and values and, and uh, that turn people against getting health care. Very complex. Shifting to another major element of this discussion, diseases occur under scientific conditions that can be studied in the laboratory, pathology, whatever. But diseases also always occur under human circumstances. And along with understanding the molecular biology and the pathology and those elements that we can study as, as academic people, we also have to understand diseases occurring under the circumstances that people live within poverty, social position, culture, environment. And that these human circumstances are also determinants of the quality of life and survival. Now here's a slide that kind of, if you ask for one slide that depicts what I'm going to talk about, this is it. I've concluded that the causes of health disparities fall mainly, but not totally, into these three circles. The circle of poverty or low income, the circle of culture and the circle of social injustice overlapping and changing with time. Overlapping and changing with time. And that these factors, which I'm going to discuss in a little more detail, operate from prevention, detection, diagnosis, treatment, all the way to the end of life. This is a, this is a concept. Uh, and people might challenge as to whether this is a concept that is totally correct. I think that it is. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to talk about these three issues in the next part of my talk. Let's first talk about poverty. When I came to Harlem, I told you that I was trying to separate the meaning of the point that these people were poor from the meaning of they're also being black. I finally concluded a few years later that poverty was the overwhelming factor uh, to cause disparities in the people of Harlem and elsewhere. However, if I had studied this during the time of slavery, um, I, I, might, I would clearly have concluded that social injustice overwhelmed everything else. Uh, but let's talk about poverty. What does it mean? First of all, poverty is a universal factor that affects all people who are poor. And that, that's a, an important point. Poverty doesn't care what race you're in. It will treat you like you're poor. You can be sure about that. It doesn't care whether you're white or black or Hispanic or anything else. Poverty is a universal factor. So to the extent that disparity is being caused by poverty, this is a universal factor that has to be dealt with in a universal way. Poverty is associated with substandard housing, inadequate inf information and knowledge, risk-promoting lifestyle, often but not always, and clearly diminished access to health care, particularly diminished access to preventive and early health care. That's what poverty means. 
look at poverty rates in America, you see that there's a difference between the white poverty level, which is about 8%, and the black poverty level, close to 25%, Hispanic level, 22%. So there are differences in the ethnic groups and racial groups of a level of poverty. But here's another paradigm uh, that I published some, some years ago. The question being, what is the relationship between poverty and culture? And I suggest, for your consideration, that poverty causes negative effects across a broad spectrum of elements, including poor living conditions, lack of knowledge, risk-promoting lifestyle, and low access to health care, particularly preventive health care, all those four boxes, and that those things relate to decreased survival. How to fit culture into the picture, the way that I do it, I say that culture becomes a prism through which poverty operates. If you accept that point, this is a prism that could either augment or diminish poverty's expected negative effects. And that's, that's, that's what I think. Now, you can challenge that. But let me give you two examples. In the culture of people that I've worked with for 38 years in central Harlem, people are primarily black, and, 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 and they have a, a certain lifestyle, attitude, behavior that is prevalent for people who live in Harlem. People in Harlem, Kentucky, who are white, we found through studying with a colleague of mine, Gil Friedell, in Harlem, Kentucky, that the cultures in Harlem, New York, black poor, were very, very similar to the culture of people in Harlem, Kentucky, white poor. They smoked heavily, they ate the wrong food, they drank alcohol heavily, they didn't trust the healthcare system in both places. A point that I'll make here, you cannot equate race to culture. Culture is whatever it is. We have to separate. There are many cultures within any race, and it's a mistake to, to indicate that race is equal to culture. So the culture in Harlem, New York, and Harlem, Kentucky, black and white respectively, <clears throat> would drive, accentuate poverty's negative effects as seen on this diagram. <clears throat> to give you an opposing example, I have visited the people in various parts of America who are the Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Adventist culture is driven by their religion. <clears throat> they don't smoke, they don't drink alcohol, and they're vegetarian. Even when they're poor, they're protected from lung cancer for the most part. These people, Seventh-day Adventists, have the longest lifespan of any group of people in America and have the lowest cancer rate. So this is the power of culture. And culture can drive it up or down. So this is a relationship that's worth looking at and cons considering. If you believe this paradigm, <clears throat> it, it offers um, a guide for what the remedies might be. Notice the box on your far right is diminished access to health care. As healthcare providers, we, we treat this like it is the universe of the problem. It is a part of a much larger problem. You can't really separate poor health care from poor housing, according to this. You can't separate diminished survival related to health care from low education level. So this is something I offer you, and if people were serious about promoting remedies, they would look at poverty not only as it reflects itself through the medical care system, but also housing and education and other elements. There's something that we now call the Hispanic paradox, <clears throat> and this is being written about more and more. Because if, if poverty uh, were the powerful driving force that it is, and we believe that it is, Hispanic people in America would be doing worse than they really are. 
Uh, so something else is, 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 is happening. I suggest that the weight of the evidence that is within the cultures of the, of the Hispanic people. A recent report is coming out uh, that will show that newly immigrated people to America in particular groups um, have three, three times fruit and vegetable intake as people of the same group that are in America for long periods of time. There may be some factors related to culture that are protective. <clears throat> and I suspect more evidence needs to come in on this that the Hispanic paradox will be best explained by things related to culture and behavior. Now let's shift to, to race. I suggest that race is the single most defining issue in the history of American society, and let me tell you why. We don't have a long time to go into this history. This covers about 500 years. <clears throat> it starts out with the Columbus discovering America, in quotes, discovered. I suggest to you that Columbus was discovered in America <laughs> by people who later were called Native Americans. That's just my theory. <clears throat> Slaves were brought to this country. The Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson. Perhaps the American dilemma written about by Gruner Medal had its origin with the Jeffersonian dilemma who wrote the most beautiful document in the history of America, the Declaration of Independence, but had more than 100 slaves himself. Perhaps that is the dilemma. A Civil War, Emancipation, Reconstruction, 14th Amendment, 1866, declared equality for all Americans. We had to fight for 100 years to make that happen in the mid-60s. Plessy versus Ferguson, Brown versus Board of Education, Civil Rights Movement. This is the historical timetable. And the point of putting this in front of you is that this is a history of America. This is what happened in America. To the extent that race matters, this is what made it matter. And let's talk about that. An investigator whose name is Omi, Dr. Omi in California, uh, has a concept which he calls racialization. It's a historical process. I buy into that. At a certain point, people come to this country from another part of the world uh, at a point when races are not prominent categories and declare people into different categories, black, Native American, white, and so forth. So it was a, a process of, a, of racialization meaning that people were assigned to categories that didn't previously exist, black and white and red and so forth. A part of this process was the people that might be assigned to some categories were considered to be inferior. But if you look at the, the American definition of race, um, and I did that because in 1997, as chairman of the President's Cancer Panel, I held a meeting on the meaning of race in science. And in preparing for that meeting, I called personally the Census Bureau to ask for the best expert they could send me to speak at the meeting. I was politely told that you've called the wrong place, which surprised me because I thought the Census Bureau determined categories. I said, well, who do I call? You call the Office of the Management of the Budget they make the decision about categories of race, and that is true. And there may be good reasons for that. Because the racial, and, and this is from, the statement you see before you is from the Office of the Management of the Budget, Directive Number 15, you can look it up. And this is what it says. Racial and ethnic categories used in the census have been socially and politically determined and were never intended to be scientific or anthropological in nature. The American government says that. But that's not what has happened um, in America. We're, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Modern science through the population genetics <clears throat> and then recently the Human Genome uh, Project have shown that there's much more genetic variation within so-called race than between race by far. 
And here's a, here's a paradigm that is too deep to go into, but I'm going to hit on the high points. The impact of racialization on social history, science, and healthcare. Big, broad categories. Another suggestion to you that to look at the problem of disparities, you've got to look across a broad spectrum of disciplines to get to the understanding and the remedies. And I want, that's a big point that I want to make here. So we had an origin of man in, in East Africa, a migration pattern. Uh, coming to this country, now we get to American history, I've shown you that. There was a racialization that occurred through that particular history. These same categories are fed into science. So scientific assumptions and hypotheses using the categories from racialization fed into biomedical science. Scientific studies circulating around and circulating around and assumptions that are assumed in the beginning circulate and never have a chance to be changed through this process. And so I'm going to suggest that there's not only been a racialization of society, there's been a racialization of science. But science has gradually disentangled some of these elements over time and have demonstrated, in other words, that economic status, culture, and genetics have, through scientific study, been largely disentangled from race. In other words, if you're in a race, it doesn't make you necessarily in a certain economic status. If you're black, you're not necessarily poor, although that's been assumed in many settings. If you're black, you're not necessarily genetically the same as other people who are called black. And if you are black, you're not of one culture, and you could say the same thing for other races. So science has advanced this and separated economic status, culture, and genetics from race. And this is a very important uh, uh, trend of knowledge. And biomedical science needs to catch up with this trend. Uh, even at the government level, level, the NIH and NCI haven't caught on to this quite yet. By these arguments, I'm suggesting here, and this is maybe a shocking conclusion, but I do believe this is true, that if you separate the presumptions about economic status, genetics, and culture from race. The question is, what is left? And I suggest to you that racial construction was and is essentially a manifestation of social injustice. And that doesn't mean we can stop using race. I don't believe we can stop using it until we fix the problem. We're going to call race what it is. And that's an argument that might shock you a little bit, but that's what I believe. Leading to some recommendations. Universal access to health care, including prevention and treatment, should be provided to all Americans, irrespective of their ability to pay. But at a minimum, people with lethal diseases, such as cancer, in my opinion, should qualify immediately for health care. Uh, immediately, just the diagnosis in and of itself should qualify people to be treated. It's not civilized not to treat people who have cancer. And yet, the hearings that we held even four years ago, issuing a report called Voices of a Broken System, we found that people couldn't necessarily get treated on a timely basis, even when they had cancer. Another concept. We have found at the NCI and elsewhere, that you can look at the county level and, and study diseases such as cancer, incidence, mortality, survival. And so we now, we now know at the county level to what extent people die, uh, have an incidence of a disease such as cancer. And so I would suggest, and, and, and also in keeping with a particular study that I wrote along with a colleague uh, in 1990, in the New England Journal of Medicine, an article published called Excess Mortality in Harlem, we showed that a black male in Harlem in 1990 had less of a chance of reaching age 65 compared to a male in Bangladesh. 
a third world community. So geography then becomes important as a determinant of how we could target our educational and access resources. So geographic and culturally defined areas of extreme access mortality in America should be delineated, and we say designated as chronic disaster areas. Now we've heard, particularly recently, about acute disaster areas. Uh, we had a tsunami in December. We had Katrina a few weeks ago in this country. And you know, Americans tend to respond, and rightfully so, uh, to acute disasters, floods and hurricanes. We should. But you know, I've been working in a community that has been in a chronic disaster state for, 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 for decades and decades. And we don't respond to chronic silent disasters as we do to acute disasters. I suggest we need to do that. Example of what I'm saying here, report issued um, during my term as, as head of the Center for, for uh, Producing Health Disparities, Cancer Disparities at the NCI. Here's a map <coughs> showing color-coded death rate in America, white females, black females. The purple areas are uh, areas of excess cervical cancer mortality. We found that in these areas where women are dying from cervical cancer at a high rate, a disease from which nobody should die today. In the same areas, they were dying at a high rate from breast cancer, from colon cancer, from heart disease, from strokes. I suggest that just as we use bio, biochemical markers and molecular markers to make diagnoses, why not use social markers to determine where we should put our resources? I want to put in another point here. Individual people need to be a part of the solution. And so I suggest here, and I always do, that individual people need to share in the responsibility for promoting their own health. Uh, we need to do some things systemically, but people need to take responsibility as well. People don't need to smoke. It costs money to smoke. Uh, personal responsibility becomes important. Another concept I'd like to leave you with, there's a need within academia uh, to look at this paradigm. We develop biomedical science places such as the wonderful place here. Uh, I, I, I've been so impressed uh, today as I've gone around and see, see what excellence is abounding here. Um, and at the NCI, the same thing, biomedical science. But when you look at disparities, you have to know that you cannot solve disparities completely from biomedical science. We need to overlap the disciplines of biomedical science with social science and understanding of American history. That's not being done to the extent that it should be done. I also challenge us to also include in this overlapping civil and human rights. So here's a paradigm. I'm presenting this to you for the very first time that I presented this to anybody, because I just came up with this thought recently, that our, there should be an interdisciplinary investigation of health disparities that should not be limited to the disciplines that we particularly work within ourselves. Let us bring the biomedical scientists together with the social scientists and the historians and the anthropologists and bring in a third wave, the people that are concerned about justice civil and human rights, let's bring them all together. I'd like to end up with a description of a program that I established in Harlem starting in 1990 that's becoming a national program. I had provided screening for breast cancer in 1979 in Harlem, and it did help. But something was missing, and, and it was the point that people were coming in to be screened, but they couldn't get through the healthcare system because they were uninsured. Uh, the, the, the hearings in 1989 pinned this down for me and began to theorize that there's a critical window of opportunity between the point of a suspicious finding and the resolution of the finding, which might be through treatment, and focused on that, and created the patient navigation model. 
The, the yellow line on your left is a point of abnormal finding. The yellow line on your right is a point of resolution, either by determining that what was thought to be abnormal was really normal or that the person had cancer or any other disease and you resolve it rapidly and with good quality of care. This is the patient navigation model. In two studies, quickly, before intervention, um, through screening and, and, uh, and patient navigation, we had a 39% five-year survival with breast cancer. After intervention, a 70% five-year survival in the same community without changing the poverty level or the minority status. And here are the two studies put side by side. In the early study, only 6% of women had early breast cancer. In the latter study, 41% early breast cancer. In the early study, 49% uh, late cancer of the breast. In the latter study, 21%. So we did something to impact this problem without changing the demographic graphics of, and here's the result, 39% versus 70% five years about breast cancer in a poor black community, Harlem, without changing the demographics, but changing what we did for the people. And here's the President of the United States uh, smiling in this picture. I don't know, I'm not sure what his emotions would be at this particular time today, but uh, <laughs> He's smiling on this particular day. This is June 29th, 2005. The President of the United States signed into law the Patient Navigator and Outreach and Chronic Disease and Prevention Act based on the model that we created in Harlem. Some final thoughts. With respect to race, we've had a long, arduous history in this country from 1492 to the present. There's something about America that moves toward positive change, in my opinion. So today, I don't think the problem of race is related to very much to intended harm. I think we're now dealing with unintended bias, for the most part. Because in our society, I would suggest, with its background, that we see value and behave toward one another through a powerful lens of race. This means that we assume how people are before we know them, because they're in a category, looking either way. And this can do harm to some groups of people. Let me suggest also in the final comments Poverty is the principal driving force of disparities, but I would suggest that no one would disagree with this, that poverty should not be an offense that is punishable by death. People shouldn't die because they are poor. And I'm going to end up with a philosophical bend. This year, 2005, is the 100th anniversary of Albert Einstein's theory of special relativity, in which he came up with the equation E is equal to mc squared, relating energy to mass and the speed of light, an absolute genius conclusion, without doing laboratory work, as many of you are involved in. Out of his head, comes up with this theory. And so, when you think of what Einstein was saying, he was saying, that the, there's a time-space continuum, four dimensions, time and space, one thing, interrelated. He then would conclude that a straight line is not the shortest distance between two points. Why? Because space is curved. Who would have thought of that? He concluded that Two objects falling from a height are at rest one to the other because they're falling at the same rate. He would suggest that a bolt of lightning struck in the middle of Seattle and seen by one person in the south and one person in the north would be seen differently actually because they see it differently from the relative positions. 
And I'm, but Einstein said, there's one constant, and that is the speed of light, which moves at 186,000 miles per second, never changes. So there's a point of reference, so important that there be points of reference to guide us. And so I'm going to make a, a leap here. Einstein certainly seemed to be right, according to what has been proven since, that his relativity theory is correct. I'm going to raise the question whether there could be a sociological application of Einstein's theory of relativity. To wit, perhaps the way we see things is from the position that we have in life, the manner in which we see people through the lens of race or any other lens and making assumptions. Perhaps in place of the speed of light of Einstein, the constant, perhaps for us the Declaration of Independence is the constant which we can look to as a point of reference. And in fact, Bruno Mandel himself, who wrote the book called The American Dilemma, came to Columbia University in 1976. I went to hear him speak. And with tears in his eyes, this tall Scandinavian person um, said, he described the problem that he'd written about, the dilemma between uh, races, but he said there's something about America that I love. And that is that because you were founded on the principle of the Declaration of Independence, you have within you a society that will tend to correct its wrongs over time. And he said, that's what I love about America. And that's what I love about America, too. We might have been wrong, but there's hope for change. Because even as kindergarten people, we're taught that all men are created equal. To finish up, the unequal burden of disease in our society is a challenge to science, of course, but it's more than that. It's a moral and an ethical dilemma for this great nation. And Martin Luther King put it this way, of all of the forms of inequality, injustice and in health, is the most shocking and inhumane. And I will leave you with this thought. As you're at an academic institution and you're concerned with academic pursuits, but I would suggest to you this, that scientific truth must always be wedded to social justice. And here's a great thinker's words himself, Albert Einstein, what you see, he said, depends on where you stand. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much for coming to our community, and this was just an incredible presentation. Um, I'm Maxine Hayes, and I'm the State Health Officer for Washington. And um, one of the things that um, you said that really struck me was the um, incredible lens of race through which so many who interface with uh, individuals in the caring co uh, uh, profession face on a daily basis. And so we I atrogenically create um, disparities. And I think the healthcare system probably is the last one to even admit that we ourselves are just as responsible for the um, disparity in health outcomes. So one of the solutions that I've thought about a lot, and I would love to hear your uh, thinking about this, what would happen if our institutions, and in this particular case I'm going to choose hospitals, um, because they have uh, JCO, uh, which is an accrediting body. And it is clear to me that what gets measured actually gets done. And if we were to ask and have as part of the uh, things that this accrediting body looked at, 
was by race, what are the outcomes in these institutions? I think that we would begin to pay attention to some of the biases that are built into our response uh, to ethnic populations. Because it gets paid attention to if it is done in a, um, in a report. And so I, I invite your thoughts about that because um, we want to change the behaviors of institutions, uh, systems as well as individuals. And these lenses are absolutely present. And I think um, these systems are going to need a push um, to actually look at how they are doing. And this is one way to do it. So I, I would like your response yes. to that. Uh, I think it's a very thoughtful comment. Um, and I do believe that the remedies that have taken place so far uh, have centered around trying to develop cultural sensitivity, and I think that should be done. But the, the history of the nation suggests that corrections in behavior are related to monitoring and measuring. Uh, as in the civil rights movement uh, in the mid-60s, the things that came out of the civil rights law of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Fair Accommodation Act of 1968 were put into laws that then could be, then you could monitor behavior. So I agree with the principle that you have laid down, but I would make one modification uh, with all due respect. <laughs> um, not to measure it according to outcome per se, uh, in, as a broad category, because we receive patients into the hospital at various stages of disease. Some of the outcome, as I was described in Harlem, there was not very much I could do uh, when half of the women were coming in with incurable cancer. So I think that the, the monitoring should be according to standards of care that have been established for people presenting with certain findings and not outcome in general. Thank but you I, very I agree, much. I agree with you. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm over here. Yeah, hi. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I like your uh, ideas about having a social uh, justice kind of uh, Einstein's equation. Uh, but I wasn't sure I agreed with you about uh, using the uh, uh, Constitution uh, as the uh, speed of light equivalent. Uh, I wonder if uh, part of the problem in our country is uh, too much talk about freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom, freedom, freedom to go to Iraq and other places where maybe what we really need is a different kind of uh, constant that relates to something like Adler's uh, uh, hierarchy of needs, that there are needs for, uh, that are more important to be able to say what you think someplace, needs to, for uh, 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 a shelter, uh, food, and health care and that some of these uh, uh, great cherished freedoms, even the First Amendment, are backwards at some level, and that we need to maybe a new kind of way of looking at some of the, uh, what our values are in this country to get people to really move in this area. What do you, I'd just like your comments on okay. that. Okay, that was a very good comment. And, and I think that the, the Declaration of Independence document is a better document than the Constitution. Uh, if it being technical, and I, it, looks like, it seems like to be very knowledgeable. Uh, when the Constitution was written, there was a three-fifths rule, uh, which meant, counted uh, black people who were slaves as three-fifths of a man. So I agree technically with you. The, the, the point of the statement uh, is to give a broad guiding light uh, to American society, which is a Guna Mirdal adaptation. I, it's not my statement. It's something about America. The way the country was founded uh, on democratic principles is a very important. Uh, in other parts of the world, we don't see that at all. So, so at least the little children growing up in America come up under that general context that, that the fairness is important. That doesn't mean that that's the end of the problem. From that. Global concept. You have to, to, to 
to burrow down on individual problems as you're suggesting. But I'm suggesting that if you don't have the, the general thinking and feeling of a country in a certain cultural um, camp, you have a much lesser chance of fixing the problems that you want to drill down on. So I agree with you, and, and the statement that I made had to do with the global uh, movement of being in a country that is founded on freedom, equality, democracy. Uh, as a person living with AIDS, I find your viewpoints really prof profoundly um, refreshing from a, pr a member of the profession. But the problem I find is that many members of your profession are not as broadly educated or have as wide a view as you. And often when I've tried to bring the larger issues of sexism, racism, classism, and gender to the treatment of AIDS issues here in Washington State, you know, you could almost hear a pin drop in the room. It's as if people had never heard of them or that wasn't imaginable or it is so dominated by the medical model that it's hard for me as a consumer to make headway. So I'm curious, do, do you think that can really be resolved or do you think we've just gone in the wrong direction? Well, I, I, I'm a person that is hopeful. I have lived through difficult times myself, um, which has made me sensitive to a lot of issues. I, for example, have lived half of my own life in legalized segregation. Um, uh, I, I um, am the great-great-grandson of a slave who bought his freedom in 1838 and called him free man because he was free. That's why I got my name. So I'm, I'm proud of that. So I think when people are sensitized, uh, I am through my history, you are clearly through your particular health problem, you're, you're, you're very sensitized to the issues. One of the problems at the basis of your complaint, I think, is that the healthcare system in America is market driven. Market driven. It's a business, primarily. That doesn't mean there are a lot of, not a lot of good people working within the system. But if healthcare in the, in the national agenda is a commodity, something that you buy or you can't afford or you can't afford, then I think we're in somewhat of a fix. The physicians are incorporated into that, not necessarily by intention. Um, most of the doctors that I personally know are very idealistic people driven to help people. But in America, since you're into a, a business commodity, market-driven uh, field as a doctor in most cases, but not necessarily so when you're working an institution, that's an exception to that, you tend to be uh, encompassed by the market-driven society. And so I, I think that it's a deep problem, but the problem of medical doctors uh, uh, acting in the way that you have, have indicated is a part of a larger systemic problem in America, which has to do with health care as a commodity rather than a human benefit. Thank you. Yes. I wanted to make a comment uh, from the perspective of a medical student in terms of the definition of race as a sociocultural and social justice entity instead of a biologic entity, which I, I agree with your definition completely. But my, my comment is that in, uh, in the wards and in the learning experiences, I think that race is still seen as a biologic definition. And it's uh, when we are being presented with the results of a study that shows differences in outcomes or differences in response to a medication by race. The sorts of um, sort of solutions that are looked for are more in terms of biology and less in terms of social justice issues or sociocultural issues. True, um, <clears throat> and, and as another, as I'd like to get into an example of of what you're saying. <clears throat> for the first time, a few months ago the Food and Drug Administ Administration uh, approved a drug called Biodil, which is race specific. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's a very uh, unfortunate occurrence. Um, we know uh, from modern knowledge, population genetics and genomics now that 
And certainly, if you understand the history of how people got assigned into races in the first place, you know that race is not a biological category. But unfortunately, I showed you a slide that had racialization, uh, the categories being fed into biomedical science, and then circulating in the way that they do. So we're in a country now uh, where it appears to me that we can't divorce ourselves from the use of race as a measure of equality or inequality or remedies, uh, w which is the way the, uh, the, it is stated in the, uh, in, the, in, in the document that I showed you from the government. But we have mixed in, even in biomedical science, we've mixed in the category of race in such a way that it's being looked at as a biological category within science, even at the NIH, NCI, other government agencies. So, and, and we're reporting on groups of people according to race, like the Biodeal study was studied in a way that only black people were in the study. So whatever conclusion you made, there was no way to generalize it beyond black people. Now the company that, that drove it uh, got a an extension of, of its ability to sell the drug without being generic for another 20 years, so something involved there. So, I, But I believe that it is going to be on the, the burden of people in your generation, because I'm not going to be here, you know, as long as you are, uh, and to, to, to fight this issue. Uh, the young scientists, young medical students, uh, young practicing doctors, to not accept the way that this is being handed down uh, through even through government, even through the scientific communities of government that are not distinguishing race in the way it should be distinguished. It should be, if we're talking about black and white, we ought to, if, we, if we put black and white in a study, we ought to say what we mean by black and white in the study. And then we can debate what we mean. But if you put black and white into a biomedical study and you don't even say what you mean by the category, uh, then there's room for a lot of confusion. I think we, we, we tend to make the situation worse as scientists if we don't make that kind of distinction. Thank you, Dr. Freeman, for your insightful remarks and for the dedication of your life's work. Could you cite the arguments for and against racial designations in the clinical medical record? I think that in the clinical medical record, when I was coming through medical school and beyond, <clears throat> often the history that the resident would write was be 42-year-old black male or white male and, and, and I think nowadays we've come to think more deeply about how we write medical histories, at, at least in my institution. Uh, there's a lot of thought now. So I, I think that here again, the category of, of race in medicine should be used only when there's medical validity for using the category, in my, in my, in my view. Uh, the race categories are an indicator of things related to social injustice as opposed to biological meaning. Now, you will find some categories of disease. Take the BRCA1 and 2 breast cancer, for example, that is occurring in populations um, uh, that, that can be designated. So there may be some areas to use race. Um, in, in sickle cell disease, it's, uh, although it's predominantly among black people, it's also in people of other parts of the world. So we have to be very thoughtful, I think, before we use the categories in the medical record. But I wouldn't be absolute against it if a strong argument could be made about why it's being done. The danger of using it is We've seen cases where sickle cell disease has been the impression when it was acute appendicitis. 
And so the assumption is black male coming in with pain in the abdomen, sickle cell crisis. So you discontinue your differential diagnosis and miss a diagnosis. So there's a danger in some of the assumptions centering around use of race. So I wouldn't totally rule it out on every medical chart, but I think if you use race in a medical chart, you ought to, you ought to have a good reason to use it. Thank you very much for your, your talk. It was very, very interesting and very useful, I think, for everybody. Um, I, I wanted to go back to some of the priorities that you put forward, which I think are fantastic. The idea of universal health care, fighting against racism, fighting against poverty. Um, but all of these things, I think, are real radical changes in American society. And if we kind of look back at American society, the, those kind of radical changes in the past have, have always come about through mass movements, like the civil rights movement that you talked about. And I just wondered what you thought about the prospects for those kind of movements developing again today. I think they're very good because, um, because the, most people in this country support, for example, universal health care. They, they're opposed to the war in Iraq. Um, Bush's approval ratings are way down um, right now, and so forth. Th those, kind of, those kind of attitudes, especially after Katrina, lay the basis for the possibility of people really fighting back again. And I think they're going to have to do that against the wishes of both of the established political parties, which are committed to the you know, priorities of, the, of a big business rather than the kind of priorities you put forward. So I just wonder what you thought about the prospects of that. The pro prospects, I don't know. I, I've been in this a long time. I've seen some changes in my nearly 40 years in medicine. Um, I am of the philosophy that you should keep saying what you believe is right. And, and some people would say, not, not practical, but I never stop saying what I believe is right. And I've seen some changes occur slowly over time. But the change that needs to occur now, I think, and I illustrated it in, in one slide, overlapping civil and human rights to biomedicine and social science. That has the best chance of changing the system at this point. If people become convinced publicly and politically that health care, for example, is a civil and human right and bring in the same arguments that we brought in with respect to racial inequality, there's room for change. But it's going to take public will which forces political change, in my opinion. So I think the, 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 the point of, of energy in my opinion this time, should be to bring in the civil and human rights communities into the fight and make it a legal, a legal fight. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. Um, your example between Harlan County and Harlem struck me because they're two places that are very dear to my heart and also because they provided a contrast between a completely urban area and a predominantly rural part of the country. I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate on geography and particularly the distinctions between urban and rural community fits into your paradigm of culture and uh, economic status and social injustice. Yes, <clears throat> I think that um, it's a very good question. We have actually looked at this in my work at the National Cancer Institute. Um, we, at the county levels that I illustrated on the maps, some of those areas are rural and some of them are urban. And, and we now have the data at all areas about cancer outcome, incidence, mortality, survival. There are differences between rural and, 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 and urban, mainly related to concentration of, of population. That's the biggest challenge. If you go to some parts of America and you talk about cancer care, you may be talking about traveling 100 miles to get to the cancer center. Uh, we actually heard testimony about this. So distance is, is, a, is a huge problem in, in, in rural communities to get to the point of care. Uh, but I think there are similarities uh, with respect to to economic status, the, 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 the counties that are doing the worst are the poor counties of any race. But then when you drill down to try to help a particular county, 
then you, it, it comes into effect, well, who are the people, what are the circumstances, what is the infrastructure, uh, wh what is the distance factor. So you, you have to settle it uh, at each place, uh, recognizing some general problems that are similar, which relate to poverty and lack of education and lack of insurance, but knowing that geographically you have different challenges when you go to a rural community to fix the problem than you do from to, a, to an urban community. Thank you very much, Dr. Freeman. Thank mm -hmm. you.